Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Quincy at the John Wood Mansion. Built in 1835, just the time when Quincy was becoming the hotspot of the anti-slavery movement in Illinois. Documents have just come to the notice of the Quincy Adams County Historical Society to show just how hot the anti-slavery sentiment was. Well, Gene Kay, just recently, you know, here you are at the Historical Society and right. you're looking for a way to, to improve your organization mm -hmm. and you get a grant to go through the database, et cetera, and boom, what, what happens? <laughs> well, uh, our new program, Past Perfect, makes it much easier to locate items that we've cataloged. We're able to do a better search. Mm -hmm. And so as we searched through and, and started looking at the files that had been converted to Past Perfect, we discovered that we had a very rare item, which is um, an anti-slavery, the Illinois Anti-Slavery Convention. Uh, it has the minutes of the convention, mm -hmm. and it also has a list of the people who participated in the convention. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful thing is, is that there are 66 people from Adams County who put their name to that convention, and at that time that would have been um, a risky thing to do. Yes. This was held, it says, at, at Upper Alton. Correct. So I, may, I assume that uh, Elijah Lovejoy had something to do with organizing this, I Oh, I, I would, would say so, yeah. Um, would you just open that for okay. us a little bit? Because we kind of like to see what something, that, that was held in 1837, Seven. was Okay, yes. 1837. The, it includes the minutes. Yes, and, it uh, has the minutes mm -hmm. in the front, and it was printed in 1838. And this is the list of the people who mm -hmm. attended, and it starts with members from Quincy. Mm -hmm. And then over here are a few members who were from Fairfield, and that's now Menden, Illinois. I see. Okay, so Adams County was represented by a, 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 roughly a quarter of the, yes. those members in that society were yes, from Adams County. Yes, approximately 25 percent. So you'd have to, we'd have to conclude from that that Adams County and Quincy was a leader in the anti-slavery movement, no I doubt about it. I would certainly think so, yeah. yes. You didn't know you had this. There are only 10 of them in the world. Apparently, yes, <laughs> when we looked into that. Yeah, yes. isn't that terrific? Yes. We okay. have many wonderful things like that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, you'd hope that you know where they all are and you yes. know what they all are, but, well, but it's nice we, to be surprised once in a while. We could locate it instantly when we found that we had it, but yeah, right. it's, we have many, many things, and so mm -hmm. we're not aware of everything, and that helped us to alert us. Isn't that amazing? Yes, yeah. it was a wonderful uh, You fun. probably have a copy of the Declaration of Independence and it's sitting I'm around here and you just don't <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now we are going to talk about some of these individuals, but I'm going to ask you specifically about Chittenden? Is that his name? Chittenden. Chittenden. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's, what's his significance? Well, he, of course, was one of the signers, and he was the founder of Fairfield, and the name of Fairfield was changed to Menden because there was another Fairfield in Illinois already, mm -hmm. and so they had to change the name. So he came from the east and brought a, um, a group from uh, that area here to Menden where he settled it and mm -hmm. started the little village there. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, one of those who were very interested. The, the vast majority of the people uh, that signed uh, their names to this convention were from the East. There were very few that, that had Southern connections, mm -hmm. of course, which mm -hmm. is logical. Yeah, and so many people that settled this part of the state were from Kentucky. Uh, or had come, lived in Kentucky for some yes, time. Yes, there were uh, probably a, about a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can see why their sympathies might have been, even if they didn't want to be slave owners, you can see why they might not yes. have wanted to stir, stir it up. Exactly. Um, while you were looking through this and, and savoring this piece, what, what arrives in the mail here but a, <laughs> a sort of a diary or a, a, a life of one of the men who signed on? Right. We received a package from the state of Washington, and in there was what it's really an account book. And in the front, it just has accounts. Mm -hmm. and, but as we thumbed through it, we came across this writing in pencil. And as we read through it, we realized that it was... Um, a, a biography of the Burns family, 
and uh, specifically the John Burns family by John's son, George. Mm -hmm. And John was the first signer in this book from Quincy. <laughs> wow. And so we were just So now you delighted. get a chance to learn all about him. All about Burns. Yes. This looks like it's only weeks old. I mean, and it's pencil. <laughs> yes. It's in pencil. Look how yes. well preserved it is. Yes. From 18, well, it starts, the, the history starts in 1831. I imagine it was written well after that. But it's amazing how well preserved that is. Yes, it is. Mm. Yes, it is. And uh, so we have things like that happen all the time. It's it's what we call serendipity. Serendipity. It just yeah. shows up. This shows up in the mail from the state of Washington yeah. at the same time that you all and are connected are, perfectly. Oh, and that's something. <laughs> well, as we go through this program, we are going to learn about the uh, the leaders of this movement. Correct. Uh, and they are, in some cases, some of the city fathers of Quincy. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to visit a couple locations where the uh, the abolitionists actually served as underground railroad sites and helped the slaves find their way out of slavery into the free world. Um, we'll visit a couple of those places. So yeah. thanks for uh, sharing this You're with us. Welcome. This is a real boon to the society. It certainly is. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Jean. you. Well, Reg Ankrum, we are, we are now in the John Wood Mansion, uh, and we are learning that in the 1830s, Quincy was the hotbed in Illinois and, and maybe in the country for the anti-slavery movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were really surprised when we ran across the document that we've seen, the, the official proceedings of the state anti-slavery society, and that led us to look into um, other anti-slavery societies simply because so many of those men who attended that society in Alton were from Quincy mm -hmm. and Adams County. In fact, about 25% of those people were from here. Yeah. So in, in following that up, we discovered that, uh, in fact, Quincy had the very first anti-slavery society in Illinois. Uh, it was the Anti-Slavery Society of Adams County created in August of 1835. And we've got the document which shows the birth of that society, yes. don't we? Yes, this is it, the official it's record. Called, yeah, it's called the, uh, this is the preamble to the Constitution, preamble and Constitution. And when I flip it over, we'll see the signatories here. Um, names that are very familiar to Quincyans, Eels, Keys, and others. Uh, city leaders, city, city fathers, leaders, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, this is in 1835. 1835, yeah. and we, we were so amazed too. You know, John Wood, uh, we venerate in Quincy. He mm -hmm. was the founder of Quincy. His partner was Willard Keyes, the co-founder of Quincy. Mm -hmm. But after that uh, occurrence, you never read about Willard Keyes again. John Wood was extremely public. Willard Keyes was extremely private until we started researching and finding the documents that related to anti-slavery mm -hmm. in Western Illinois. He was quite outspoken on that issue. Very outspoken. He? he was very outspoken. It was surprising uh, that you see his name here. You see his name on the uh, on the documents for the state society, and in fact, uh, he was one of the uh, managers of the state society, mm -hmm. along with all of the board of managers there were from Adams County. Mm -hmm. uh, so people from around the state apparently did view Adams County as being the premier spot for the anti-slavery movement in our state. Yeah. John, John Wood is well represented in this house by his by his portrait on the wall there. And uh, and we've also uh, laid out some pictures here for some folks. Now we talked a little bit about Keys, but uh, of course one of the founders of Quincy, one of mm -hmm. the city's fathers. And and as you say, not a, not a person that wanted his name uh, spoken or on things. He was a behind the scenes kind of guy. Right, very private. But not when it came to abolition. Very outspoken on yeah, abolition. Yeah. And then, uh, who do we Asa, have here? Asa Turner, mm -hmm. who was a Presbyterian and then a Congregational minister who founded the first church in Quincy, the Lord's Barn, uh, which is seated right next and just across 4th Street from the Dr. Richard Eels house. Mm -hmm. And uh, Asa Turner and several members of his congregation were also signatories to not only our society, the Adams County Anti-Slavery Society, but Turner's name was also on the society which was formed in 1837 for the state of Illinois. So he was very important. Mm -hmm. in the anti-slavery movement in the state. And then, of course, Dr. David Nelson, who came to Quincy, run out of Missouri in 1836. He was run out of Missouri. Run out of Missouri. Really? Um, he uh, was preaching abolitionism in a slave state, mm -hmm. and, the, and the people there were not too fond of that idea. They ran him out under the threat of his life, and Quincy gave him refuge, and he founded the Mission Institute, which became an abolitionist uh, college right here in Quincy. Yeah. And, and the tie-in there, a tie-in, is that Elijah Lovejoy actually became religious because of Nelson's preaching, didn't Because it? of Nelson. Nelson was a powerful orator, 
And Nel, uh, Lovejoy w lamented to his mother many times that he could not find the spirit he wanted. He attended two of the Reverend David Nelson's uh, meetings, revival meetings, and was so inspired by Nelson that he went back to New Haven to the theological seminary at mm -hmm. Yale and then came back a Presbyterian minister, moved to St. Louis, ran the St. Louis newspaper, the St. Louis Observer, was run out of St. Louis, started in Alton, mm -hmm. and then in 1837, under the aegis of the Alton Observer, Lovejoy's newspaper, this statewide convention was held. Interestingly, too, it was Quincy men who were concerned about the safety for Lovejoy and several times urged him to move his press and his abolitionist sentiment to Quincy, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, Lovejoy decided not to because of the Presbytery in uh, Springfield uh, supported him and said they would protect him. And one week after the convention, Lovejoy had been martyred. He'd been oh, killed. Oh, my goodness. And then, of course, John Wood, we've seen a picture of him already. Now, now Wood was not, he, he was a, a very active member of this group, but he didn't have his name on the board of directors or any of those kinds of things. And he no. certainly could have served on the board. No, but, you know, one of, one of uh, Wood called his proudest achievement in life was the prevention of slavery in Illinois. In 1822, the state of Illinois um, mounted a campaign to create a constitutional convention. And that convention was designed to make Illinois a slave state. It tried to come in in 1818 as a slave state, didn't do it because the Northwest Ordinance prohibited slavery in the Northwest Territory. Mm -hmm. But the Southern legislature, and with one exception, they were all men from the South, uh, decided to mount a constitutional convention to make Illinois a slave state. John Wood fought that in the, the area between the two rivers, the military tract, and uh, it was defeated thanks to Wood and people like Morris mm -hmm. Birkbeck on the east side of the state and the governor of the time, Edward Coles, who himself had been a slaveholder, released his slaves and fought this movement mm -hmm. to make Illinois a slave state. Yeah, I think a lot of people aren't aware that there was a referendum, a yeah. public referendum to, to vote whether Illinois should become a slave state or remain a free state, and, yes. it, and it failed. Uh, Reg, during this program, not only have we gotten it, we got to see these wonderful documents, but you mentioned a couple of interesting people, Dr. Eels and, uh, and, and Dr. Nelson, mm -hmm. and they, their homes are still here and they served as underground railroad sites. Right. So we get a chance to visit those places during this program as well. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, Dave Oakley, it's fitting that we would wind up here after talking about the Anti-Slavery Society because we're on Absolutely. Jersey Street between 4th and 5th in front of the Dr. Richard Eels house. Yep. And th this house has a very interesting history, part of which is that it almost was torn down. Yeah, that, you know, that part of the story is uh, just amazing. And, you know, I remember it was about over 20 years ago that uh, the house was dilapidated, uh, had not been lived in for, you know, years, there, you know, overbrush, uh, outside and they were going to tear it down, uh, make a parking lot. And fortunately, there were a few people who really knew the tremendous history uh, of the house and they banded together, uh, pulled together the funds to buy the house. And that was just the first step. And so they were able to do that, convince people not to tear it down. Um, and then there were subsequent renovations and support that way. But mm -hmm. uh, from that, the organization, the Friends of Dr. Richard Eels, uh, was formed. And, you know, as a board member and the people involved, uh, I do f feel kind of a kinship, you know, and when you go in there, you hear the story of uh, Richard and Jane Eels and what they did, and you feel kind of like a friend continuing that legacy, that story of what they mm -hmm. uh, what they did, and, right. and the story's tremendous. And this, this is a documented Underground Railroad stop. Absolutely. Dr. Eels, when he built this house, I guess it was 1835. 1835, yes. I, I guess it's understood that it was his intention to be able to help slaves get through here to freedom. Absolutely. He was an abolitionist uh, at that time. He was a founding member of the local abolitionist uh, society. He built the house in 1835, and uh, over the course of time, they don't know how many uh, slaves that he was able to help, but they did say that at the time of his death at his funeral, he had over 200 uh, free slaves show up for his wow. funeral. So that's an indication that there were lots and lots of people that he uh, helped support. Yeah. And, you know, the story how he was, this ultimately got documented. You know, there's a lot of sites and people talk about well, this is part of the Underground Railroad. Yeah. It was such a secretive thing. You know, now it's a badge of honor, of pride that, uh, 
you know, Dr. Eels was an abolitionist mm -hmm. and he stood for that important uh, moral value. But at the time, you know, it was extraordinarily conflicted and abolitionists weren't uh, very kindly taken, uh, you know, looked at. Uh, people felt, well, if you feel that way, you know, you can be in Missouri, but in Illinois, we're not going to have slavery, but we're not necessarily going to support this conflict that was yeah. going on. Yeah. Uh, you know, Dr. Eels and the abolitionists took that stand, and, you know, really the story uh, started here, and, and it's, it's, we just love, you know, continuing the yeah. story. But we're, the, we're on Jersey Street between 4th and 5th, and this, let me show a picture here. This, this is really a hot spot of anti-slavery in Quincy and the state. Yeah. Because here at the Lord's Barn, which was on 5th Street, just a half block from here, this was the church where the anti-slavery society guys were meeting and planning how they were gonna kill this. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, It's amazing, and it was uh, uh, an interesting story. And I'll just tell you a little bit of the story, if you, if you don't mind. Well, I'll tell you what, let's do, let's go inside and we can continue the story in there because right. there's indications in there of how this was used as the Underground Railroad Absolutely. site. Absolutely. Okay, all right, Mark, let's do that, so. Well, Dave, the Eels House has been added onto several times. And what you and the, the, the board have done here is you've made this back place, which was an addition to the house, into a meeting room and sort yeah. of an interpretive center as well Absolutely. to, to uh, describe to people what, what occurred here. But here's what I wanted to get to, because this is cool. This was the original house and Correct. this was the back door yep. and the slaves you know would have come up to this door to get into the house because you, it, you did some excavation work and you found out that here's the walkway that, back to the carriage house. that's right well there was three you know different additions there's the very original edition and then this edition would have been put on in 1841 and we actually found this door and when they did the excavation uh, they found this walkway so uh, when Charlie uh, the runaway slave that uh, made all the national news mm -hmm. um, would have come, he would have come to this door and knocked on this door looking for help. Um, and uh, we find that to be extraordinary and it's been really extraordinary that we found this piece and uh, the walkway. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much of the story yeah. you well, know. In but fact, we, we tell a little bit about Charlie because Charlie was the one, the, the slave of record who was actually uh, Mr. Dr. Eels was prosecuted for, for helping him, but he was actually found moving Charlie to a safe location when Charlie had to escape because he they were caught. Yeah, yeah. That, that was it. So he would have come in August, uh, you know, 1842. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Eels would have waited until very late at night. I think they said around midnight. And he, you know, got Charlie into the back of a carriage and he would have gone a route that we would, I think approximates going out uh, to State Street and up to 24th Street. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a, a bounty out on Charlie. There were slave hunters out looking for Charlie at this time. So it was a known uh, thing that there was a runaway slave mm -hmm. and both people trying to help Charlie as well as people trying to catch Charlie are working. And they identified Dr. Eels and started chasing him. So about 24th Street, uh, the old cemetery there, uh, at that point, Charlie lifted his head up from behind, you know, a cover in the uh, the carriage, mm -hmm. jumps out and starts running, um, and he ended up getting, you know, found about a mile away. At the same time, Dr. Eels continued uh, and ended up going home, and you know, it didn't work. They were trying to get up to the Mission Institute, about 25th and uh, Prentice, 25th mm -hmm. and Main area, and never did make it. What ended up happening is uh, Dr. Eels the next day gets a knock on the door and the sheriff is there to arrest him and say, hey, uh, we've caught the slave, you helped, his mm -hmm. wet clothes are sitting in your carriage house. Mm -hmm. And so that case ended up being prosecuted. Uh, Stephen Douglas ended up uh, finding him guilty of help, helping, you know, Stephen finding- Stephen Douglas was the judge. He was, Stephen Douglas was wow. the judge. And it, you know, you hear all this in history but in Quincy, it's, it was a very local yeah. thing. And so he was a judge, well-respected judge. Mm -hmm. uh, he found Father, uh, Dr. Eels guilty, charged him 400 uh, bucks. Um, I think he spent a night in jail. Uh, and there are a lot of really wonderful stories uh, about the Eels helping, but ultimately that went to the Illinois Supreme Court where Dr. Eels lost and ultimately uh, uh, went to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court where he was represented by William Seward and Salmon Chase wow. 
<laughs> and so they were great friends of the, the president. Mm -hmm. And this was after his death. He had died, but that mm -hmm. you know, ultimately uh, was settled. They lost the case in the U.S. Supreme Court. But what that case did is documented um, that this was a, a, you know, a first stop on the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. that Richard and Jane Eels, you know, well-known abolitionists, were very active in helping uh, slaves to their freedom. And it's a great reason why we're thrilled to work to keep this location alive, to keep the story of Dr. Eels, mm -hmm. the abolitionists, and even Charlie. You know, you, you know, you hear about those that get through and then there, there are those that didn't he ended up yeah. being returned to, uh, uh, you know, the farm in Monticello, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And we don't know ultimately what happened to him, but uh, he did get returned and uh, that was an unfortunate case. But certainly there were many, many people that Dr. Eels uh, helped. I, mm -hmm. I mentioned that, uh, you know, at his death, uh, Dr. Eel's death, he had a ceremony, he had over 200 freed slaves who'd come to, to honor Dr. Eel. So there may, may have been many, many more, but a lot of people passed right. through this site and were helped not only by Dr. Eel's, but by the whole abolitionist mm -hmm. movement at the time. So yeah. that's kind of the history of the story. So I hope I didn't go on too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dave. Okay, great, great. <laughs> Just west of Quincy, Dr. David Nelson also completed his house in 1835, and it also was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Well, Ruth, uh, a Dr. Nelson built this house back in 1835. Mm -hmm. You've lived here for quite some time, right. long enough to have done some research yes. uh, about what, what went on in here. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you've come to be very certain that this was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Yes, because we knew that he, did, he was uh, in this, well, program or whatever you call it, you know, with ministers of trying to help the slaves get to the north mm -hmm. and get free. So mm -hmm. this was one of the stops from the Mississippi River on up, mm -hmm. went on up to Menden and, and uh, up there. And then uh, on up, I think, well, I'm not sure where all the places are, but on, all the way to Chicago. Mm -hmm. they, once they got to Chicago, they could go to Canada and then they were really yeah. free. Now you, you did enough research actually to go ahead and, and write a book about it mm -hmm. entitled The uh, Underground Railroad Ran Through My House. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because you've got, uh, you not only have, have the title page here, but you've also got some, some very interesting work that you mm -hmm. had done, like this photograph of these children yes, hiding. My and, children. Yeah. Uh, those your, are your Six children. Six of those who children. Who found the hiding uh, place. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. and, and it's yeah. actually right in this bedroom, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna hold a light mm -hmm. here. And we can get a look down in there. Now, okay. describe to us what we're looking at. Uh, well, there's, there's, you're looking into a hole, and this, the, the stones and the bricks are all part of the chimney and the fireplace downstairs. Mm -hmm. And if they, there's a place on each side of that chimney where they could stand, or right on top of the firebox, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'd say, and and they could, hide and stay warm because they would cross the ice in the, on the Mississippi when it was cold. So this is a way of keeping them warm. Could hide them here, and not only hide them, but keep them in a place where they'd, they'd be warm, mm -hmm. if only for a short period of time. Right, right. Yeah. And then they would move them on to Menden, mm -hmm. to Deacon Jar Platt's place. Mm -hmm. that I showed you downstairs. Yeah. And, and Doctor, what do you know about Dr. Nelson? Uh, well, he was um, a pretty famous surgeon down in Danville, Kentucky, and he assisted at one of the first abdominal surgeries ever. And uh, this Dr. Ephraim McDowell was there, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Nelson was one of his assistants. And they performed. This woman came with a massive tumor, and you know, she was about to die. And so they performed that first abdominal surgery that lived, and <laughs> she mm -hmm. lived. And Dr. Nelson was the assistant at that he, surgery. He and his wife built a large house out here outside of Quincy. This is our house. Yeah, your house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. In 1835. This would have been quite an undertaking, wouldn't it? A house yes, this size. Yes, 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 yes. But they had a large family. Mm -hmm. They had 11 children. They had 12 and one died. They had and 11 children and still were able to help the slaves. Oh, yes, yes. And she was, you know, even though she was raised <laughs> with slaves, she still helped, you know. Mm -hmm. She kept yeah. quiet anyway, yeah. you know. And right. so, uh, yeah, she was a pretty remarkable woman herself, I think. 
I've always admired her. <laughs> she didn't get all the credit, but yeah. I admire her. And what her. was her first name? Amanda. Amanda. Amanda Francis Dedrick Nelson. She was a <laughs> Dedrick, and she was proud of the Dedrick name, and mm -hmm. she didn't give it up because yeah. they were quite influential in, in uh, Tennessee. So, yeah. yeah, she was a real little woman, four foot, and he was big, six foot and big. Yeah. They were kind of an odd couple to look at, I mm -hmm. guess, but mentally they were pretty comparable, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah. anyway. Well, thanks yeah. for showing us oh, this. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Enjoy showing it. You know, we really appreciate it. All our kids really love this home, and, and they, like you say, they hid from the babysitters. <laughs> Those that could get in and out. <laughs> hid from the babysitters. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's okay. <laughs> Other documentation is coming to notice here as well, not only about the anti-slavery movement, but the anti-abolitionist movement. And you can look for an exhibit sometime in the near future. With another Illinois Story in Quincy, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.